Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English in our study of Shakespeare now continues with the great history play Henry V. Uh, there's always been a debate about what is the greatest of the history plays and many have argued that Henry V is it. I think it's probably more fair to say that there's the continuation story that um, Shakespeare will be messing around with in Henry IV part 1, part 2 and then Henry V. I think taken collectively there, there's no doubt these are probably three of the greatest t uh, texts ever written and we're going to spend our time with Henry V but there is an assumption that you know about young Howe in Henry IV part 1, part 2 and, and, and we'll get into that conversation. Now Shakespeare wrote as we have said before ostensibly three types of plays. He wrote tragedies, he wrote comedies and then of course these histories. Scholars have, t have pointed out that it's very possible that the history plays were actually more popular in his day than in either of the other two plays simply because of the celebration of British kings and British history. We will say about Henry V right away, put it in your notes, that this is one of the great plays about speeches. We think, of course, of our comments of, uh, uh, of the, the two great speeches in Julius Caesar, but here we're going to get some amazing speeches and as well the evolution of a young man, the, the uh, young Hal, as he will be referred to, before he becomes Henry V, King of England, after his father passes. This one first presented in 1600, which is an interesting date for us. Write it down, of course, because we know that Hamlet was as well presented on stage. And we're going to make this observation later that there's a lot of ways to study this play. One really interesting way to study this play is to look at young Hal and to look at young Hamlet and see some of the ways that they will have similar kinds of concerns, epistemologically, ontologically, and the like. Now, we have a number of assumptions, as we have said at the beginning of all these lectures, a number of assumptions that we want to review. The first is, of course, that you have been working with us at LearnStrong.net in the AP folder. Our background regarding, for example, Shakespeare, we're not going to get into that, but the assumption is that you know that information. Our learning theory of the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. Our three levels of reading are the way that we do that through our annotated process. At level one, what does the text say? Summary. At level two, what does the text mean? Two A, three, uh, messages, themes. Two B, the rhetorical approach, and here we're studying pr primarily on symbolism and irony. We'll see quite a bit of both in this play. And then finally, at level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? Of course, here we're asking that um, at 3A, how can I relate to other texts that I know? And then finally, at 3B, how can I relate to myself personally? We also are assuming that you're familiar with our big five, as we've been calling them. That is to say, we're asking about all of the Shakespeare plays. What are these plays? What does Henry V have to say about epistemology and what we can know about ontology and who we are, about psychology, the individual mind, about sociology, the political um, um, understanding of the group, and then finally the question of theodicy, the question of evil and justice um, in, in a world created by an all-loving, all-powerful divinity. The final assumption is that you're reading this material on your own, and then you're coming to our study here uh, together. Now, we want to be working through a summary, and then we'll address this, um, th th uh, these concerns that we have just uh, outlined. Now, think of it this way. If we are, in fact, as we have said so many, many times in AP, if we are, in fact, the stories that we tell and retell, the stories we accept, the stories we reject, and by the way, Hal is a classic example of a young man, a hellion, growing up with Falstaff and the crazies at the tavern, who finally has to make his break, and ultimately he will do that, and, uh, and we will see that beginning to develop in Henry IV, part one, part two, and then finally here in Henry V. Now, we should point out that Shakespeare assumes a certain kind of knowledge by, on the part of his audience, that we know about Hal's daddy, Henry IV, Bolingbroke, the way that he uh, um, usurped and took over the throne, and then the life that he had, and then finally his death, and then, of course, young Hal coming to the throne to receive the, 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 uh, the throne. And, and with that in mind, the other characters of, of Falstaff and Hotspur and the others of the, of the previous plays. Um, and and uh, then the play will open. Henry, uh, the, the fifth young, uh, young Hal, uh, who now has become king, he opens with a conversation with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and, um, and, and this is interesting as well as, the, uh, as, well as uh, the Bishop of Eli. And they're having this private conversation about a bill that's been just recently reintroduced to, to Parliament. And the bill will allow the church um, to, uh, uh, will allow um, the government to take land and property money from the church and put it into the treasury of the king. 
there's a whole economic reading of Henry V. I'm not going to get into a lot, but there was a Marxist reading of this play, and an economic reading of this play is quite fascinating. Um, of course, why would Henry V want to <laughs> get all this money? The, the Scooby Snacks, of course, it has everything to do with going to war against France, which is ultimately his, uh, um, his, his idea. Now, Canterbury is a little bit kind of uh, um, uncertain about this idea of sharing the, the, the church's wealth. Um, and so um, he, uh, Canterbury, the, the uh, Bishop of Canterbury, decides to offer Henry a, a, a large amount of this uh, to make the bill basically go away. The extra cash, of course, Henry's going to be able to use in his invasion of France, which is ostensibly the whole thing that's going to stand behind this play. Right? And obviously the troops that are a part of that. Um, we've got a loophole that's suggested. Canterbury then will encourage Henry to invade France and to basically put himself on the throne of France through some kind of um, divine right. Um, um, it, uh, it's pretty clear that Henry is excited to do this, right? He doesn't really need much for pushing in this regard. And, and, um, and, and he, he believes he has the right to the English crown and the French crown. Um, his great great grandmother was in fact the daughter of a French king, so Henry, uh, you know, believes that he should have this right. Uh, the, the the French, on their count, then have um, um, ha have to, uh, you know, obviously have a response to this, and so. Let's put it in our notes. We've got an interesting tension here between the French and the English, and uh, Henry V is going to exacerbate this tension that's already there. Canterbury, uh, the, the Bishop of Canterbury, will advise uh, that, they, um, that, that the French ambassador has just showed up, and now it's time to lay things on the line. It, it, um, and, and Henry has, in fact, um, tried to claim some French dukedoms and the ambassador now is bringing a message from the Dauphin. Now, write this in your notes. This is the king's son. You can see it mirroring happening here between the French and, and the French king and his son, the Dauphin, and of course uh, now Henry, who is once was Hal. And there's a reputation that Hal had as being a hellion, a kind of uh, you know a prodigal waster of money and the like, hanging hanging out at bars and that kind of thing. And he is not taken seriously. Uh, by the Dauphin. Uh, the, the message that is sent is actually a bunch of tennis balls. Now, let's put it in our notes at 2B. At two this is, of course, symbolism writ at large on stage. The tennis balls speak directly to the Dauphin's disrespect of Henry and therefore England. But it also speaks to the notion that Henry is not a real king. He's kind of playing, the same way you play tennis, playing uh, at, at this whole thing how Henry V is outraged and will in fact say that ultimately um, he, he, uh, you know, he's going to turn these tennis balls into cannonballs, that is to say he's got every reason now to go to war. Right? Now, um, we have a little break here from all the politics of this and we um, are back with, um, with Bardolph who is still hanging out with the old crew, Pistol, Mistress Quickly, Nim, in, uh, in Egypt, in London. It's a slum of London, okay? This is where Hal used to hang out back in the day, right, when he was just a crazy young prince. And um, we hear about Falstaff, who, of course, it's one of the greatest creations. I, I wish I had more time to talk about this with you guys. One of the greatest creations of Shakespeare. Uh, this wonderful, fun-loving guy, Falstaff, who uh, is, is sick and, in fact, um, will die. He doesn't die on stage. He dies off stage. Um, and we'll have a whole exchange about the way in which he died and, um, and, and the sadness that is surrounding this moment. Meanwhile... We're back to Henry's, um, Henry's life, and more particularly a plot uh, uh, that has been hatched against um, uh, him by uh, uh, some of his own closest associates. The French have paid off three English noblemen, Scope, Gray, and Cambridge, to kill him. And, uh, and we, we also find out that Cambridge, is, it's not just about money for him, he's actually involved in... Um, in trying to, it, he thinks he has a better claim, uh, along with Mortimer, to the English throne than, he, than Henry does. Uh, Henry 
you know, as we said, he, he's on the throne because his father, Bolingbroke was his name before he became Henry IV, um, and, um, he will uh, usurp Richard II. And again, that play Richard II to Henry IV Part I to Henry IV Part II all is the backstory to what's going on now with Henry V. And it's not surprising that his father's um, actions have led to some negative energy. Um, Henry ultimately did, uh, will find them out as traitors and he will then execute them. So put this in your notes. How was the young Hellion? Henry V as a king, he will deal with, tre with treacherous traitors and, uh, and then he's ready to go to France. Across the channel he goes and he's ready to go to war with uh, Charles VI, the king of France. Uh, the French, however, um, they don't take this whole invasion thing that seriously. Put it in your notes. Henry V is constantly um, not considered a major, a major consideration by the French. They underestimate him in almost every way. And then we have the Dauphin, who thinks that basically Henry and his army are really kind of impossibly juvenile, childlike, and that this battle, whatever it's going to be, will be a complete and total joke. Let's put it in our notes, though. It, it isn't a complete and total joke. The English will defeat the French in a shocking defeat and, of course, make Henry V forever one of the greatest monarchs in the history of, of England. Right? Henry's troops land uh, uh, in, in the northern part of France. They, inv they, inv uh, they invade the, the town of, of Hartfleur. And uh, there, during the siege, you have Henry's famous battle cry, quote, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, he will say. Um, they, uh, um, before anything can happen, however, we got a small group of captains who are kind of standing back as far as possible from the fighting. These, uh, these leaders then will engage in a major debate, which this will come up later in the play as of importance, about warfare, the art of warfare, and uh, the fact that you know soldiers end up having to do the dirty, nasty work that the generals will, will um, iron out. The French will call a, a parley, um, a, a cessation in fighting. Henry will uh, stand before the gates of Harfleur and will warn the governor that if you don't surrender, then horror will be rained down on your city. And, you, and we get a sense Henry ain't messing around at this point, that in fact if they don't surrender this town, um, that there's going to be gross kinds of overactions here against the French. And we find out that, a, that, that the uh, earlier characters in Bardolph and Nim have been caught looting um, and have been sentenced to death by hanging. Meanwhile, the rest of the English troops are seriously discouraged, no question. They're exhausted, they're outnumbered by the French troops, and the night before the Battle at Agincourt, and this is the heart of our play, Henry does something quite fascinating. He will walk through his camp. He will try to, you know, motivate them in some ways. He will change his clothing so that he's disguised. And we've seen this so many times in our Shakespeare plays, haven't we? Both in the tragedies as well as in the comedies that not always being what you are, you know, represented. And he wanders among them, and he listens to them, and the ways that they are talking. Um, and he finds out that most of the warriors are, in fact, not at all that motivated to fight. They, of course, point out, <laughs> not realizing they're talking to the King of England, how they're the ones that will die. And, of course, the, the, the upper class, the nobility, they won't, they won't hardly even be wounded. The king, um, um, were, were they, they, they even will posture that the king, if he is, if he is, does lose or if he's captured, he'll get ransomed while the, the normal soldiers will, will have to fight and then die and probably be tortured. Henry it, it has an interesting argument with Williams, one of, the, uh, one of the persons that he meets. And the question is whether this war is even a legitimate war, a just war, as it will be re often referred to, right? And, and Williams declares th th that the king is the one responsible when the English soldiers in the end are all going to die the next day. Now all of this is, is really going to influence the way Henry thinks. It's clear. And Henry will make an interesting argument that the king in the end is not really responsible for the lives of these men, even though they have to follow his orders. 
that the king is in fact doing the right thing by telling them that they need to go and fight. However, in a famous speech when Henry is alone, he will in fact muse on ceremony and muse on the fact that the king lives in a very isolated kind of world and existence. And this is, of course, diametrically opposed to the life that Hal lived when he was with Falstaff and his pals. But now it's a rough, it's a rough life to be a king. And I think it's significant at this moment to pause and put this in our notes. We often will look at those in a power and authority, and we will imagine that because they have this power and authority, that they somehow have an easier life. Maybe the president, maybe congressmen or women, um, and then all the way even to um, parents and authority figures in that, in that regards. And this speech will remind us that often it's a very difficult thing to be a person in power and authority, especially, of course, if you're a king who is having to make decisions about who will die, who will live. Well, the next morning we're ready to, uh, to get to war, and of course we've got the famous speech that Henry will deliver. Um, the, the, this is one of, without question, one of the most famous speeches in all of Shakespeare. Uh, lines such as, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for today, he that today sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. These are great lines for us. Henry will convince his troops that it's actually a good thing that they're so outnumbered because once they win, they will have tremendous reputation for having defeated the large French court. And it is a miracle of all miracles that, of course, the French not only win the Battle of Agincourt, uh, but only a small number of British, uh, English troops die in the process, right? Um, four nobles, 25 commoners are the only ones killed, while the French, on the other hand, uh, lose hundreds in the, in the battle. Henry then will, um, uh, will say the reason for the victory is not him. He shows some humility here, even if it's, even if it's you know, politically necessary to do so. He will give the victory and the uh, reason for the victory to God. And, um, and he will say that if anyone tries to celebrate themselves, they will, they will be put to death. After the battle, Henry goes back to England um, for a, a, a large ceremony. And then he will come back to France, and the peace treaty will involve not just King Charles and Queen Isabel of France, but more particularly Catherine, the fair Catherine, who he wishes to wed for political reasons and maybe for love as well. Um, you, you've got a, a wonderful exchange at the end of Henry V, where Henry, who knows very little French, and Catherine, who knows very little English, try to have a conversation between the two of them about what's about to happen. There's multiple readings of this scene. One seems to be suggesting that, you know, Henry basically tells Catherine, you're going to marry me whether you like it or not, but it's maybe possible that Catherine has, you know, a reason to want to, uh, to, want to be with, with Henry and enjoy the, uh, the power between England and France. The play will end um, with an epilogue. The chorus comes out on stage and um, reminds uh, the audience that soon Henry V must die and his son Henry VI will in fact lose France and have to, uh, you know, and have to live with the repercussions of that. Well, that's the play in summary at level one. Let's now work with our big five and then on to levels two and three. Epistemologically, what is it that this play suggests? Well, young Hal, who later becomes Henry V, has to come to terms with what we have called epistemologically the fallibilist position, namely that he can't be always absolute in his knowledge, and so he has to become, uh, at times, he has to become very, very humbled by that, by that realization. Walking among his troops, being just one of the guys, even though they don't recognize him as that, ontologically will teach him something as well about what it means to be a king, what it means to be a beggar, the roles and the responsibilities of each. Each have to learn what he or she is and what he or she is capable of. Psychologically, of course, this play will talk about the power of self-introspection. And the ceremony speech by Howell is just a classic example of what does it mean to have to work through the whole notion of what it, what it is to be a king. Sociologically, well, here we're talking the power of a good speech and the way in which a good speech can motivate people to go on and do great, great deeds. Put a note to yourself in 3A, and we'll get there later in a moment, but... We saw this as well in our study of Beowulf, didn't we? That Anglo-Saxon epic poem where Beowulf will give these great words of encouragement before going off usually to fight. 
The question of theodicy in this play is a tough, tough question, right? Because as Voltaire points out, the victors write the histories. And to that degree, we have to ask if there's justice in this play or not. Or is this rather just a study in the, the, the notion of realpolitik, of Frasimachus, and you'll, you'll remember we taught about him in our study of Plato's Republic. You can go back and find those lectures in Republic One. Might makes right, or of course Machiavelli's notion of strategic violence, if in fact that's all that's really going on here. And then after the fact, then you will you know, claim that God was on your side. So it's a thorny question, the theodicy question. I'll leave it to you. Shakespeare does a brilliant job, of, I think, of showing us multiple sides to the theodicy question. In terms of themes, messages of 2A, several possible that you could write down. You gotta believe in yourself, this play teaches, to overcome the obstacles that inevitably are coming your way, that level of confidence. Another major message is the power of language as a tool for motivation and, of course, manipulation and propaganda, no question. Another message here uh, when we study, especially the French response to young Hal, who is now Henry V, is you gotta be careful when you underestimate people because ultimately they can, that can come back to haunt you. At 2B, well, symbolism here, obviously how as young man and then Henry V as king, and that notion of growing up is obviously a symbol of that. And possibly as well the other up, as we have often said in 303, there are two ups. There's growing up and there's waking up. Uh, the perspicacity that seems to come to Henry V. He seems to have an insight that his father, Henry IV, did not have, and certainly the, uh, the, the king prior and Richard did not have. The irony, well, there's a lot of them, and obviously the symbolism of the tennis balls is a classic irony here. How France and the Dauphin will underestimate uh, um, Henry V, and in fact, that underestimation will lead then to the defeat on the part of the French. Finally, at level 